Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, first workshop of um, the second day of the Open Science Fair. We are very glad that uh, you are joining us this morning and uh, I hope uh, you can see my slides now. So I'll just start with a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, we're using um, I don't see your slides, Irina. Sorry, maybe it's only me. Yeah, that's it. I don't see them either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me <laughs> yeah, looking good now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, it's a Zoom meeting mode, uh, which we chose uh, because we wanted to to be interactive, uh, but it means that uh, every participant can. Uh, speak and uh, show video and um, we're asking you if you don't mind if if you're not speaking please uh, make sure that uh, your mic is muted uh, and because it's a meeting mode uh, we don't have a Q&A so let's use chat for questions or so please raise your hand and uh, speak up if you have a question um, and also we have a collaborative notes document uh, and um, Please uh, add your name in that uh, notes document if uh, you want to stay in touch uh, about uh, the results of this session. Of course, we have your name in the registration list as well, but uh, if you would please add to the shared notes document uh, as well, uh, it would be easier for us to know that you attended and you want to keep updated uh, about uh, this uh, session. Um, and uh, as you see, the session is recorded. And um, if you don't want your video to be in the recording, please uh, turn it off. Um, and also, if you don't want your name to be shown, uh, please uh, change it. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you, you don't mind uh, uh, being recorded. Uh, and. Uh, recording uh, will be available um, on uh, the Open Science Fair YouTube channel and also in the Nodder together with a slide deck that we'll use today. Um, and uh, for social media, we're using the hashtag OSFair2021. And we also have code of conduct. Uh, so Thanks a lot for joining uh, this uh, workshop and uh, over to Ellen. So this, this is, um, I'm moving the slides, Irina, if you could uh, introduce the community of practice. Thank you so much. So it's uh, the RDM training and support uh, catalog workshop uh, that uh, was put together by the community of practice uh, of training coordinators. Uh, and uh, if you're not uh, a part of that community yet, please do join us if you're interested. It's um, an informal group of people that includes almost uh, 100 uh, participants so far. and. Uh, they are training coordinators from uh, research and infrastructures, uh, national and institu institutional uh, competence centers and training programs. Uh, and uh, it was set up in uh, 2018. And uh, we have monthly meetings and we also have a mailing list and Slack. Uh, and uh, we who are part of this community really enjoy it uh, and uh, it's useful to discuss and share experiences and work on uh, certain topics together like today's topic um, and if you could please go to the second slide ellen uh, these are some of the results uh, of our collaborative uh, work uh, for example uh, last year when uh, we all switched to online training uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, online training events that we organize it here to gdpr or for those of you who are not from europe general data data protection regulation rules uh, 
So we um, organized a workshop where we discussed uh, good practices uh, for organizing training of events adhering to GDPR rules. Uh, uh, we also actually met face to face uh, in February last year to discuss training in EUSC, which is European Open Science Cloud again, um, for those of you who are not from Europe. Uh, and then many of us were part of uh, EOS skills and training uh, working group and uh, together we produced this report on um, digital skills for fair and open science uh, and one of the current projects is uh, this document that uh, you can see is a spreadsheet co colorful spreadsheet which is called mapping community of practice members activities to EOS report recommendations because now we are looking at uh, what's already going on to implement activities suggested in the report and where the gaps are and where we should focus better. And also um, one of our newest projects uh, now is a task force on uh, recommendations and checklist on making uh, trading materials fair. And uh, we've just started uh, and we hope we'll have some results early next year. And if you're interested in that topic, uh, please do join and uh, you can either indicate in the chat or in shared notes documents that you'd like to join and yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to work with you. Thank you and over to you, Ellen. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone also. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to have Irina here as well. Uh, but we have many other people and the workshop is about um, training catalogs and we thought it would be good to uh, have uh, introductions on uh, a couple of uh, training catalogs which is very very short it will be very short only two minutes each but we start with uh, um, a short presentation by Elizabeth on uh, the RDA uh, focus group on minimal metadata learning resources followed by uh, Laura uh, Malloy and Alison Lister on terms of fair skills. And then after that, we hope to have an hour to have some discussions on the challenges that um, we experience with saying we, uh, some of the catalogs that are present here. So it doesn't mean everyone, <coughs> but. <laughs> um, and um, so we've got a, uh, um, collected the challenges that we see and uh, would like to discuss that with you. And also if you um, have ideas on how to solve it, but we would like to start with um, uh, introducing ourselves. And there's, I don't know if you already mentioned um, managed to go to the mentee um, and otherwise I, Put it up here now. Um, I also put a link in the chat and also the code is in the slide. So if others could manage the chat, I can stop share and go to the mentee now. Um, um, let me see if I can somehow. So this is an issue because now I can. Yes. And I would like to share the screen. And let me. I think I will try to do it like this. Okay, I hope you can see the Minty now. We can see a slide. Okay, what is your current position? Uh, we see your slides. Not... Oh, you see my slides? Well, um, but I think you can go to... Uh, yes, and it's in the Menti we can see uh, what is your current position. Good. Um, so then what I will do is just mention, <laughs> because I've tried two ways now. 
and otherwise it takes more time than we have. So uh, what I see is that um, 25 people have been able to fill in and most of them, 17 of them are research support, five researchers, seven trainers, five catalog service providers and seven other. And um, I think we can go to the next question. Uh, so most of the people here are research supporters and trainers and only six researchers, but it's good to have them because they can, we are um, really interested for um, what catalog catalogs you currently use to find training resources. So we've put some of the catalogs there that we are also presenting today. You might not know them yet. And we put Zenodo there and the EOSC portal. And we mentioned none of these or other. And I wait for a bit. Now we already have 20 nine people, 30 people. So the majority of course uses uh, Zenodo, 16 using Zenodo, eight using EOS portal, which is surprising to me a bit, but that's good. It's good sign people find the EOS portal. Seven use Elixir test, which is of course very discipline specific. So it's, this is, the um, EOSC pillar five, uh, the shock training discovery toolkit five, none of these eight. So maybe because they don't know it, but it could also be because it's not useful for them. So, and eight other. I think um, this gives the speakers also some valuable information and um, I will try to make some images and paste them in the notes in a minute, if I can, okay? Um, let's go to the first, if you still see the slides. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, give Elizabeth the word now, who is uh, one of the members of the focus group. I mute myself. Thanks, Ellen. So yeah, I'm sort of giving this presentation on behalf of our our focus group. So this is part of an RDA interest group and uh, we have a focus group looking at minimal metadata enabling discovery and findability of learning resources. You will have noticed that this interest group and focus group likes to have the longest titles possible to describe what we do. We're all into describing everything so hopefully the focus group title describes what we're looking at doing. Um, I have just put the link to the RDA group uh, website as well. So if you want to know more or want to join the group at some point, the link is there. So we've been running now for probably nearly about 18 months, not quite that long, but sort of working quite intensely, meeting every couple of weeks. Um, oh, Ellen, your slides have changed. I can now see the menti. And we've lost the uh, uh, the presentation slides. We should have started with coffee, like it was suggested when we were advertising this event. <laughs> Strange how many times we've been doing that. <laughs> I, I'll just share my screen and I'll carry on. <laughs> so. Uh, I think you can see my slide, the slides again now, why Stalin sorts itself out. Apologies yeah, thank that. you. <laughs> so, as I said, we've been working for probably a bit over a year quite intensely as a group, looking at, at the challenge that we, we set ourselves um, was looking at how do you find um, learning and re resources and training materials and what's the best way to discover these. So we, we sort of like thinking about what, what metadata is users and we were looking at a minimal, minimal set for that. Um, we were taking the approach as well from, are you a learner looking for materials? Are you a trainer who's providing materials? Or maybe um, 
you're actually a service or infrastructure provider, which relates to um, our colleagues on the call today, which is about you know, catalogues um, and how are they going to put out materials in a consistent way. So our goal is to identify a minimal set of metadata descriptors that can be recommended. Um, it's important for any resources from different learning sectors, so it's not um, subject specific or anything, so it is supposed to be across the, the whole range of training resources that are out there. And we're looking to have a core set that can be adopted by learning resource creators and service providers. And we want to help to reduce duplication and identify gaps amongst um, existing and prospective learning resource service providers. So if you're perhaps thinking about how you're going to set up a catalogue or something, where do you start? So we did some mapping across different schemas to generate a master list of metadata, um, which obviously you can imagine produced quite a long list of elements, um, which was far from minimal. So we developed some user stories to help us focus from what does a user actually want to get out of this? And we concentrated on the findability aspect. How do you find resources was our, our key question. So we assessed the metadata, the long list against the relevance of the different stories and did some harmonization. We did a number of community exercises and engagement through the RDA plenaries and other workshops. And we've come up with a set of 14 elements which I've listed on the screen. And I know some of you are probably thinking, wow, 14 is still quite a lot from a minimal set, but we actually wanted it to be specific for learning resources as well. So that's why it's longer than just a few uh, key things like title and things. We needed to have some specific resources that actually are about learning resources. So you'll see things like the target group or audience, the learning resource type, the learning outcome, and other things like the expertise level. So this is our minimal set, which we're still um, putting some text around and um, some explanation. Uh, and and that, that's it really. That's my five minutes or a few minutes on giving you a flavor of what we're doing. But we really want to be able to see how this minimal set works in real life and can be applied to catalogs and learning resources. Thank you. Do you want me to carry on sharing, Ellen, or do you want to take over? Um, let's give it a try. Yes. Um, I think I could also ask uh, Laura or Ellie to. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Hello, everybody. My name is Laura Malloy. Uh, I'm the senior research lead here at CODATA in Paris. And CODATA is the Committee on Data for the International Science Council. And we work on data policy, data science, data skills, issues for the benefit of science and society. Terms of Fair Skills is one of the projects we've been really involved with for the last couple of years. Terms of Fair Skills is a terminology to describe the skills of making and keeping data fair. And I think one of the most important things to say is that it's a highly collaborative project. We've been working together with a wide range of partners since January 2019. And you can check out the details of the wide range of partners that we've been working with through the link on the slide. You can see at the top there, there's an info link, termsforfairskills.github.io. And Celia, who is here today, will be speaking about the important Elixir implementation in a few minutes' time. So Alison and I are speaking today on behalf of the Terms of Fair Skills community. And you can access and examine the Terms of Fair Skills terminology via the link as well. And I think the important things to just say is, um, by means of introduction is that it's an, we, we went forward with an iterative model design process, which Alison will say a little bit more about. And the whole terminology is open. It's stored on GitHub for community use. Again, you can access the repository via the link. It's traceable, it's fair. It follows best ontological practice, which I'm very pleased to say. Alison will be able to tell you more about that too. We have around 500 terms at the moment with about a third of those from the well-known CASRI Research Data Management Glossary. And the remainder come from the range of expertise from our many project partners. So one of the ontology team, Alison Lister, will now share more about why we built the terminology and how we were thinking about it as we went forward with development. Thanks, Alison. Thank you, Laura. Right, so if you would switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. So Terms for Fair Skills um, 
was originally initiated by Laura and a few other members of the team. I came in a little bit later to help with some of the really fun bits, which of course is the ontology itself. Um, I have a background in a number of life science ontologies and I do enjoy messing about with vocabularies and terminologies. So what I like about Terms for Fair Skills is it's really a new area for me that I really that I enjoy talking about. And so what they were doing is what we were doing is looking at the training resources available for data stewards and how they are fragmented in places and how Terms for Fair Skills can really help um, provide information about the competencies, about the skills and about the knowledge necessary to make data fair and to keep data fair. So some of the uses that we envisage for Terms for Fair Skills is um, discovery of fair data and discovery of training resources. So you can facilitate the annotation, the search and the evaluation of fair enabling materials. You can uh, search for these training materials and other training resources. You can also help design data stewardship curricula. Um, you can train uh, using terms for fair skills. You can help trainers who teach fair data skills, help researchers and help others who wish to identify skill gaps in their own skill base. And finally, it can help with any kind of formalization of knowledge about training. So you can help uh, define job descriptions, you can help organize CVs, you can help structure the sort of competencies that you might want out of a prospective employee. Um, we've had a number of resources that we originally drew on and we wanted to create a nice high level view of, of uh, the landscape. And we brought it, we brought in a number of different resources when they were originally doing the, um, the use cases and competencies for terms for fair skills. Um, a, a quick note about the ontology development before we move on to the last slide. Uh, Laura mentioned iterative development. So what we would do is we create a model, then we'd go to our community and we talk to them about the model and about the terms we were using. And they would help us with uh, curation. Well, how do we determine? How do we call it, Laura? It was curatathons, annotatathons. 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 <laughs> Not my choice of term. <laughs> And we would uh, we would go to the people in the terms for fair skills community like Celia and and the project that projects that she's involved with, and we would actually annotate uh, training materials with terms for fair skills. And as we iterated through the model, if we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. You get to see a lovely view of the current version of our data model. And so um, to finish with the last 30 seconds or so, you don't need to memorize the whole thing, but I'm gonna take you through a short use case. So let's say you're a data steward. So you start on the right-hand side of the model where it says role. You are a data steward and you'd like to learn about metadata. Now that's a technical concept and you can follow the once knowledge about red arrow to take you to the center of the model. A data steward wishes to learn about metadata. And the metadata itself contributes to the implementation of, for example, a fair principle uh, F2 rich metadata, okay? And then you can move along the model again, and you can say a webinar, if you look along the left-hand side of the model under learning medium, a webinar, a particular webinar on a particular website might confer knowledge about metadata. So it has a link from the concept of the webinar through back, back through to the metadata itself. So what you can do is you can use the terms and the relationships between the, the terms as described in this model to join what data stewards need with the webinar that can help them. Okay, and we've been building and iterating through this model since, uh, well, at least a couple of years now. And we've got a number of reports that you can find more information about on our website. And we are using lots of uh, different use cases and we are looking to use more, primarily as Cecilia said, and she'll talk more about, you can, we did a lot, we've done a lot of talking and working with Elixir Training and the TESS Training Registry, who are going to, in the process of um, incorporating terms for fair skills into the registry. 
Um, I think I've probably gone over by a little, so I apologize, uh, but I, that's all me. That's me done. Thank you. No, thank you. I think it's it's very good to have a use case to go through the model. I think otherwise the slide is not that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it helps. So thank you very much. I, I would like to uh, uh, continue indeed with the uh, two minute madness of the catalog catalogs and Paula, I think that um, you are the first, so. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Paolo Set. I am involved in the EOSC Pillar project. Um, we have a couple of other colleagues from the project here today. Uh, EOSC Pillar is one of these uh, five uh, B regional projects, EOSC uh, regional projects. Um, and one of the challenges that is addressed in this project is uh, how to develop skills uh, to make or to realize the EOSC. So of course, training is an important component of the project. And in the tasks related to training, we have uh, developed um, training and support catalog, uh, which is already uh, live. And the idea of this catalog is to curate, to, to look out and curate uh, the training and support material related to research data management and to make them findable. Uh, but maybe it is important, and, and I think this is a slightly different from other projects today, is that we are not ourselves the producers of the training material. So basically, this was very much uh, directed or influenced by the work that we started in Kent University. So we started about two years ago as a new team of data stewards, and we found that there was a lot of uh, really good material out there uh, to provide training, but also to support researchers. And what we did is to look for those resources to, uh, to, to, to quality, not quality check them, but to, to, to see which ones were uh, good for uh, supporting researchers. And then we made them visible by publishing metadata and then a link to the resources themselves. So we have been uh, adding content to the catalog and improving or trying to improve the catalog through a series of workshops, uh, webinars where we get uh, feedback from community uh, or uh, stakeholders or, or potential users of the catalog. We have done this um, through a series of workshops organized by EOSC Pila, but also within the um, growing or emerging Flanders community of data stewards. Um, also, um, we provide both generic and discipline specific materials, although at the moment there is maybe a bias towards generic material rather than discipline specific, but the idea is to have both uh, of them. Um, we, yeah, research data management content or training resources about any, any phase of the research data life cycle. So from collecting data to processing, analyzing, but also to publishing, et cetera. And then maybe interesting, it's not only focused on training materials, so, uh, or classical training material, but things that we also find useful such as, um, for example, uh, in, the, in the slide, you can see the FAIR self-assessment tool. So this is not per se um, training material, but of course it can be incorporated into training. But you can also, uh, sometimes these are things such as checklists that can be sent to a researcher in a specific use case. So not necessarily only to give training. Um, and this is in a nutshell what we do with EOS Pillar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paula. Can, can you, so since when is it live? Um, I think it's over a year now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a, because the point that I want to make is that in the shock training discovery toolkit, many of the things that you have said about um, uh, being in a community and at the time uh, the open air advanced project was still running and uh, we were also collecting lists of, of, of resources that would be relevant for data stewards and also uh, research, researchers that wanted to know more about research data management and open science. And in the shock project, also the training discovery toolkit was mentioned as, a, as a, one of the things to to do, and we thought, well, wh why not create a uh, inventory of of materials that that are very, um, 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 how do you say, knowledgeable, and that researchers, but also uh, data stewards, can use. I think that we've done 
uh, a lot of things uh, in, in, in parallel, the same, so um, uh, a bit uh, of double working here. But um, of, uh, luckily, we, we've met <laughs> somewhere in the past year, and uh, uh, we can also combine efforts now and, uh, and make sure that the experiences that we have can be um, used later on, either in, in, in the catalogs that we, that we create or in, uh, in a larger EOSC um, catalog. Anyhow, the training discovery toolkit is for social sciences and humanities, but like the one from the EOSC pillar, the focus uh, seems to be on research data management and open science resources. Uh, we don't produce, well, some of the links that we have in the training discovery toolkit we have created ourselves in our workshops or webinars, but uh, there's also, um, uh, but, but they are stored somewhere else. So the training discovery toolkit essentially is an inventory and only uh, collects the metadata. And again, like the EOSC pillar, it's a curated um, uh, toolkit. So um, we don't just uh, add links like that. There is a curation team and we have curation sprints. Uh, our toolkit is live now for um, a, maybe a little bit more than a year, um, but uh, yeah, about the same time as EOSC pillar. We also work have worked with feedback from the community from within the shock project, but also uh, from the training community that we set up there. I think that's about it that I would like to say so that we can move on to Vicky for the Daria campus. I think that's a, a good one that's already there for more time. Uh, yes, would you mind moving on the slide for me, please, Evan? Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Vicky. I'm here to talk about Daria Campus very, very quickly. Um, Daria Campus is part of Daria EU, which um, it deals not only with open science, um, but with much broader issues in digital humanities um, as, as a whole. Um, Daria Campus itself is both a training resource suite and a discovery platform, so a catalogue essentially in, in the terminology we're using here. We host training resources from the Daria community and any Daria affiliated projects. Um, Daria campus itself there on the screen, you can see the homepage when you first get there on the left. And then um, if you look at any of the resources, I've picked open science here, of course, um, you can um, filter them down by uh, the different topics that we have on offer. And these are, as I say, the open science ones, and that's how they're presented on screen to begin with. So you get a, um, an abstract, a very short abstract, the title, and you can get a flavor of what's in their training resource. And then um, it also tells you what kind of resource it is by the different icons. So you have a course could be represented by, um, by a book. We have videos, we have webinar recordings, um, and we have full on um, training modules as well. Uh, there is a much larger presentation that you can um, get that from the link at the bottom there, the tiny URL link. Um, so um, please feel free to, to have a look at that. Um, Dari Campus itself is, um, was built using GitHub and um, it now has an overlay content management system as well. So anyone who wasn't really familiar or com comfortable using GitHub, you can use the content management system. And that was built using um, Next.js. Uh, we have metadata and controlled vocabularies there to ensure there is a structured content and also GitHub helps with um, that structure as well. We have a reuse charter in place to ensure that um, policy and expectations for use of the resources is set out clearly. And we also now have curricula, um, the option to curate um, for content providers who have um, a course in place, they can curate uh, the different resources that are available on Diary Campus. Um, that they have created themselves um, and put them together as a course so um, users can go and look and see that there are different resources from the same content provider around the same issue and, and take a course if you like um, in that context and in the interest of brevity um, I will stop there but I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Yeah thank you. Um, there of course um... Uh, it, it's it's way too short, but if people don't know it, then they have at least the information on where to find and uh, what the strong points are, which I think is 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 in your case the 
that it's built on GitHub, that it's looking really nice and that um, um, that you have curricula now as well. Anyhow, it's not my place to, <laughs> to mention the strong point. So I will go over to Celia and for uh, the test portal. Thank you, Alan. So uh, I'm happy here today to bring in the perspective of the life science domain of Elixir. And I'm also see some of the Elixir colleagues in the audience. So that, that's really nice. I want to tell you about our training portal, TESS. So TESS is a registry and it aggregates information about training events and materials. And we have been building this up since 2015 when we started the Accelerate project, which was the first major project of Elixir. So yesterday I did a check and we currently have 1,500 uh, training materials and we have uh, upcoming events. You can also see that and we have 128 upcoming, but also it's like an archive of over 12,000 past events. Um, also interesting and new, I think in 2022, 2020-2021, uh, we have now linked uh, test resources to the Elixir RDM kit, which is a resource that has been developed, is being developed uh, also in the Converge project. And I think for us, we came from the other direction. We are from the life science domain, but now we also have materials for data management. And now we have the problem, of course, that we have to annotate them too. So uh, more later in, about that in the challenges section. Uh, the majority of the entries of, of, the, of, the, of the resources that we get in are scraped automatically. There's also manual registration possible, but the majority is automatically either via dedicated scraper from all the training providers, but also via bioschemas. And bioschemas is also the automatic way that we want to go to for all our training providers. We have over 17 training content providers, and those are not only Elixir nodes. That, that's, I think, is a point that I really want to make. Uh, we have, of course, our own institutes, our own trainings, but also from the Carpentries, Coursera, Galaxy, etc. There has also been in the past many discussions uh, with test people, with people from EOS, from EOS Hub, EOS Pilot. Uh, we have working with TESS in the projects EOX Live and EGPRD. And very recently, and I'm very proud of that, we have made a contact with the Australian people. We explained them about TESS and the TESS portal. And now a year later, they have actually built, our, and the launch is in the coming period, a, date, a, 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 a training portal for all over all domains and over the whole country in Australia. So the Dreza portal will be launched very soon. And I think it's an excellent example of community collaboration. And of course, we want to become an EOS training provider. So we have to find a way to couple our uh, portal in, in wherever it has to be connected to in the EOS ecosystem. And then finally, we have the EDAM ontology in place which is the domain-specific ontology, but we also want to implement terms for fair skills. And as Laura and Ellie already said, we, ha we have been a use case for terms for fair skills since the beginning, and we are in the process now. So I'm happy to tell you more if you're interested, but uh, this, this is all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Celia. This is very concise. Now let's go over immediately to Lucia about the EOSC Future Training Catalog. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Lucia Vaira from Life of Cheric. Uh, I'm representing here the, um, the WP9 uh, of uh, EOSC Future uh, since I'm involved in, the, in this project. Uh, the main goals, as you can see in this slide, uh, are support, fair sharing, and reuse of training resources in the EOSC uh, ecosystem and uh, also build synergies since uh, we don't need to start from scratch since we cannot do this alone so we need to uh, build synergies with other uh, initiatives other projects uh, associations uh, uh, research infrastructure since we, we have to be benefit from uh, both results and uh, um, objectives of other initiatives in order to avoid uh, duplication of efforts uh, as you can see in this slide, we, we have these three tasks, and the third one is about developing the EOSC, future, uh, the EOSC uh, Knowledge Hub, and uh, the catalog is inside this uh, third uh, task. 
since we would like to uh, build it by co-designing and co-creating with the broader community. The target audience uh, can be divided into three main uh, groups. We have uh, the EOS consumers, the EOS providers, and the uh, EOS facilitators. So, and we, you, can, uh, you can read some examples here in the slide. The main functionalities related to the training catalog are listed here. I can read it uh, very fast, uh, but uh, we would like to have obviously the basic and advanced browse and searching interface that has to be provided both by via graphical user interface and uh, by APIs. Display of landing pages, uh, definition management of a training resource metadata set. And for this, we are starting from the results of the RDA uh, focus group that has uh, been uh, presented before by Elizabeth. Uh, since we would like to start from an already av um, available uh, result and then to provide uh, um, a flexible metadata set in order to, um, to be more interoperable as possible. Uh, the catalog will also have uh, the metadata harvesting features, uh, since it's very important also for the sustainability aspects, uh, but also manual content creation will be available uh, for providers that do not have catalogs, so we would like also to provide this, this opportunity for uh, that provider. Uh, review process, versioning and feedback mechanism are other uh, functionalities, and obviously also the link with the EOSC training platform will be uh, one of the, um, of, the, um, of the functionalities of the catalog. Next slide, please. Yes, here, oh, just a timeline to show you where we are. We are now at uh, month six. Uh, we have a deadline related uh, for, uh, for the deliverable 9.1 that is about the specification of training catalog. That is something that uh, I just uh, showed you. So the main uh, functionalities, uh, the main uh, user stories, uh, the user flows related to the training catalog. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will pass this kind of specification to the other WP, that are uh, responsible for the implementation and validation. And uh, we would like to have uh, uh, this, uh, um, this continuous timeline, this continuous uh, uh, monitoring process in order to co-design and co-create uh, uh, with an agile process uh, this, um, this training catalog with the first and second iteration of the, of the platform. I think that uh, it's uh, all from my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um... Yeah, so 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 now we have this two minute madness of catalogs, and we 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 are uh, done. But we are uh, we we have run a bit over time, fifteen minutes. Um, I think it would be best if we continue immediately with the uh, first challenge, and um, there is a slide on okay. that. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, this is like we talked about the different challenges that we as with our heads of catalog providers on. And one of the challenges was actually about controlled vocabularies. You will see in the slide deck a few slides that are hidden in presentation, but you can see them where we collected for our specific own catalog the challenges. But this is kind of a higher, a bit higher over summary that I have here. And also we have also a Mentimeter question related to that at the end, because we are really curious about how you are all working with this and coping with these challenges. So one of the things it's, it's very hard sometimes to find the suitable controlled vocabulary or vocabularies that you have to use. For instance, in our case, it was the example like, we have a domain specific one and we also need the domain agnostic one. Uh, it's also important that the controlled vocabulary is really yeah, close to the heart, so to speak, of the, 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 the foreseen users of your catalog. Because if it's not something that they can relate to, they will not be able to use it in a good way to do their searches. And another thing is that is also, I think, clear is that there are new controlled vocabularies coming up. For instance, the terms for fresh skills is my example, but it's like a moving target. It's still in development. And we are also in development with our own catalog and the EOS training catalog and platform is in development. So when is the time to step in? And, uh, and, and, and that, that's not, not easy at all. Another thing is that uh, it, we call it here the lack of community agreement. That is like if, 
at this time there is not an agreement yet for instance about yeah training minimal training metadata and i think with the rda group now we are moving in that direction but as long as that is lacking then it's not easy to decide upon which way to go with your own catalog and also another question that came to my mind is then okay who is then to decide for which catalog to what to do i mean and there are several con controlled vocabularies around but which one to choose so this is also challenged another thing is that that was brought up actually by ellen uh, for the shock uh, discovery toolkit but i think also we from tess are experiencing that if you have a catalog and now you want either add a new controlled vocabulary or you want to change it because there now are new insights for metadata and minimal metadata and this is not trivial at all if you can make a decision that you want to change then then it's a lot of work you need to curate uh, or do you have to change everything? Is this even possible? Or do you need to make a mapping layer so that you can map your schema with the new schema that is now the favorite one running around? I don't know, in the ecosystem, that's the challenge. And then I think finally, what we all want to achieve is that we want our catalogs to be interoperable in a catalog ecosystem that we currently do not know how it's going to look. So yeah, this in a nutshell would sum up our uh, challenges related to the controlled vocabularies. Um, I don't know, Ellen, if I missed anything. And if not, I would really yeah, want to uh, maybe get some input from the audience, how they look at that. So we have two questions for you. And of course, if there are questions from you to us, we're happy to take that too. Yeah, we, we um, in the Mentimeter, we, we uh, have a uh, question for you that you can fill in. Um, it's about these challenges and uh, can well, you show the Mentimeter? Yeah, but um, yeah, I will. Okay, but you can close the screen now. I can always put the, the, the PowerPoint up again myself so you can show the Menti. I will. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth has put the Menti link into the chat. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's really helpful. Maybe I can expand a bit. We we had the feeling that many of you here today might have um, experiences with with the controlled vocabularies and have been struggling with it so what we would be interested in is um which catalogs sorry which vocabularies are you using did you encounter some challenges and if so do you have solutions or do you have an approach that you took to 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 tackle this so this is more the the broader meaning of the question because we would be really happy to learn And I also have one side question on the of for myself, very selfish. If there's anybody, it relates to the terms for fresh skills and our work. Uh, if there are catalogs people here that have really made steps in implementing the terms for fresh skills in the catalog, I think it would be really good to get in touch so we can kind of support each other. And of course, uh, Ellie and Laura from the Terms for Fresh Skills team, they will also uh, help us, but I think it would be very relevant to, to, to join forces and see where we are. Yeah, I see some things popping up. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, I don't know, the EOS actors might be a good, uh, uh, set to to fill the target audience field. I don't know if 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 uh, Elizabeth can say anything if what the current values of the target audience field are are uh, what they are thinking about. Um, I'm a beginner in RDM. Yeah, I think. Uh, um, 
Don't, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say that um, that's one of the things we are looking at is, is the control of recoveries. And, yes. You, you know, and, and I think what we're going to have is examples and suggestions. We, 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 we could not possibly tell somebody. Um, no, no, I understand you know, that. But the right, so that's, that's, that is the challenge. It is the challenge is what do you provide for who? So. Yeah. Yeah, but that is on our. And that's a, then we are back in the circle. So how do you decide for your catalog what is the best way to serve your audience, but also to connect in an easy, interoperable way to the, all the others? Yeah. Is there anybody? Because I'm trying to read at the same time, but people uh, put in. Is there anybody who wants to open the microphone and explain about the things that they put in, the the, the comment that they put in? If you'd like, Celia, I can just talk about the one that I put in, though I expect that most people will Go know ahead. which one mine is. It might not be so. Uh, <laughs> which one is yours? There. I cannot read. Uh, it's, it's if you scroll to the top, I think it was on the top a second ago. Yeah, on the right in the green. Now, it, it might be a little self-serving, but uh, it is a general statement that I make, even if I'm not here just representing terms for fair skills. Um, it's a very general statement to just simply say um, it's important to have, if you're in the humanities or the life sciences, to have domain specific terms where necessary, but it's, it's even more important to hang those off a domain agnostic um, resource so that ultimately you can not only have those terms that you need specifically for yourself and your community, but also those that will enable interoperability with others. And that's, that's just the summary, summary of what I put. <laughs> Thanks. And thinking a bit further in, in our EO, I think many of us here today are in, 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 in Europe and in the EOSC ecosystem. Would you then think that it would be up to the EOSC, I don't know, the technical people or the CTO or whatever to kind of uh, put something like guidelines or things related to this that we at least all of us would have something to go with you know what are your thoughts uh i the, pro the problem is i don't know quite how all the different hierarchies and structures work uh yeah i mainly focus i say that as an ontologist really that's quite sad if i don't know the hierarchies if i'm an ontologist um <laughs> I think having guidelines are really useful. Uh, certainly in my other hat in fair sharing, we have a number of guidelines uh, that are that people use across lots of different communities to help to help the, the members uh, sort of participate in a using a common style and a, and a common set of goals. But uh, I couldn't say who would be best placed to do that. Uh, Celia, perhaps you you or somebody else in the community now might might do that. I think it is generally a good idea. It's a bit waffly, apologies. <laughs> no, 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 thanks. I think this is all, we, we, are, we, we are getting closer to really the technical implementation of things and the technical connecting of things. And that is not trivial at all. And we have a huge community and yeah, so we, this is where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with this workshop, we really wanted to make a next step because we have been, presenting and discussing about all kinds of yeah. catalogs and the approaches that they have. We have done this in previous workshops, in previous Open Science Fair and other workshops organized by Fairs Fair, for instance. But now we want to make a next step. And with that next mm -hmm. step comes that we simply also put our issues on the table for yeah. each other that can help us. Is there anybody else who wants to uh, comment on some of the things that they put in? If there isn't, I have just a small question, uh, maybe small, but maybe big for Lucia. If if um, the uh, EOSC Future catalog is also thinking about um, guidance on controlled vocabularies, for, for instance. Yes, also uh, we will provide different uh, guidelines and recommendations about um, several metadata fields and also controlled vocabularies, uh, thesaurus will be, will be there. 
and we will try to 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 acquire the, the experiences from uh, other initiatives in order to to have a sort of guideline as uh, um, Alison said before uh, since it's very important to to have a specific step by step procedure to uh, to provide training content and training materials thanks that yeah. would be brilliant yes so i also have the feeling and the expectation then that in the EOSC Future Project now many threads are coming together. So I'm really looking forward also to your deliverable when it is going to be released for uh, for the wider public. Can you say something about that? Uh, yes, now uh, it uh, it is uh, almost complete. Uh, we have to proceed with the reviewing, the internal reviewing, and then we can uh, we can publish it. Uh... I don't know if Irina, you want to add something uh, about the publishing procedure? Yes, we'll have uh, a public wiki page where this uh, document will be available as, as a living document for community feedback. And uh, we will email the link to everyone who registered for this workshop. Um, and um, yeah, our plan is to have it in the beginning of October. Thanks. That's really helpful. I'm looking forward to it. And maybe it can bring a lot of threads together. Um, can I ask something? Uh, this is Paula. Um, what is the, um, so how, how much does this build upon the work of the uh, ESC training um, and skills, well, or skills and training working group, sorry, because they published uh, not so long ago a report and there was also there some recommendations for metadata and control vocabularies. And so I wonder how much the EOS future work is going to, to relate to that or build upon that. Yes, it, it will be mostly uh, related on, uh, on that group. But it's more specific. Uh, yeah. What, what yeah. we are describing in, in our catalog uh, is a level down. Um... Okay, this is actually a really good point, Paula. And I also think we can maybe share the, the, the report of the working group with this uh, with this audience today. So I can put in the link later or any of the others that are here and were in the group can do it. Um, I, I just put the, the link in the That's chat. great, thank you. And also, I am also sure that the, although the report in the report is a brief chapter, we have a longer document about all the discussions. And I think we were also in discussion with, with Emma who led that to kind of re yeah, publish that also. I don't know if that is open, but there's a longer discussion uh, about the metadata and uh, the catalogs. And we have that, although it's not currently in this report because there we have to be very brief, but that's maybe for, for later. Um, um, I'm looking at the time, Ellen, I think it's time to go to the other challenge. If there, maybe if there is no more question about the controlled vocabularies. Yeah, I've just stopped sharing the um, Menti and now we are over to Perfect. the uh, next um, challenge, which will be around uh, the curation process. And uh, Paula, I would like to. Yes. So other challenge that we face in the, I think in all these projects that we're, we're trying to develop uh, training catalogs is the curation process. So how do we actually select or evaluate the quality of the material? How do we decide which training resources go into the catalog or not? And in general, I think uh, most of us experience that there is no written, there isn't really a systematic approach. Um, so it's, it's really based in the expertise of the curation team, which in general tends to be quite small. Um, so, of course, this might bring some biases in, in terms of what is in the catalog or not. And I, from my uh, personal experience, um, because, uh, and I, I mentioned that in Neos Pillar we have a bit of over-representation uh, on generic or domain agnostic resources. And I think this is mainly because uh, it's very difficult to judge uh, quality, uh, the quality of uh, discipline-specific content, because uh, when you don't have the background, then it's more difficult to assess whether this is going to be useful or is good enough um, or not. Uh, and even I think within uh, discipline-specific catalogs, there are also sub-disciplines, so it, it might be uh, the case as well. 
So we, uh, I think we have this general feeling that there is some need for uh, quality evaluation criteria or curation criteria. And it has been mentioned in the past whether we could do this collaboratively. So uh, things that could lead us to, to establish some uh, collaboration workflows uh, so that we can increase the number of people that contribute to the catalog or that the curation team can become wider, et cetera. Uh, but uh, uh, also another challenge in relation with curation is that there is uh, usually no funding for curation after uh, the project has finished. Um, so how do we make sure that the content of the catalog remains of quality after some, some time has passed and whether we will need some, some sort of deadline or expiring date for some of the material. Uh, so these are some questions that have been popped up. And then I think in the next slide, we have some specific specifics about some uh, of the uh, catalogs presented today. So in the case of uh, tests, uh, because I think you also do a lot of automatic scrapping and you have many contributors, you're not the only ones contributing to the catalog. So um, you only have control about the elixir materials. Um, and you also don't have a, a clear process implemented yet, but you're also uh, wanting to do this for a while. And uh, maybe Celia, you can explain um, later, but you have been, or you have secured some funding to work this process. So maybe you already have some ideas about how to move forward. In the case of uh, Daria, um, well, um, Vicky already explained how they uh, have this uh, content management system via GitHub, which people can uh, uh, suggest contributions. And then how the um, catalog content is actually uh, organized or presented by the use of, of tags. Um, how the, the materials from uh, the same contributors are, are organized as sources. And then the uh, recent uh, development of the curricula uh, uh, where you can um, develop or select different materials and build them into a specific course. Um, maybe if you want to expand on that, uh, Nikki. And then uh, about EOS Future, um, which I, I would share the words of Celia, maybe uh, there will be a, the, the outcomes of the EOS Future project will tie a lot of the things that or yeah, address some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, so um, it seems that you will have this community validated quality criteria for training resources. I'm really interested uh, to know more about that. Um, and that there will be a, one of the func functionalities of the catalog uh, will be a review process. Um, so I guess uh, to add new materials, the review process is embedded in the, in the process of adding materials. Um, but maybe you can explain a bit more about the reductional workflow. Um, I think we will all be very curious to hear about it. Um, I'm not sure if we have also a menti question for this challenge, Alan. Yes, we do. I've opened it up um, and I can just share it also. Yeah, I wonder if some people in the audience have um, or are aware of other initiatives. It doesn't have to be necessarily for training uh, catalogs, so it's maybe other type of catalog or registries. Uh, so how, you know, guidelines uh, about evaluation criteria that we could uh, draw inspiration from, or what is what are the current plans of your future? I would be very curious to, to hear about. Some, some ideas that we have um, in the US future project is uh, to have uh, rules of participation uh, in the US portal for training service providers and include their almost like uh, an obligation. If, if you join the uh, US portal with your training materials and uh, you commit to keeping them up to date and then try to hold uh, those who hold materials responsible uh, for for that quality assurance, uh, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it's it's too optimistic. I also like the solution that is mentioned in the 
in um, in the Menti building a system to capture users' feedback, uh, because that works in so many places, um, like even uh, restaurants. <laughs> well, it's also commercialized, but uh, in this case, I don't think uh, we will have to be too afraid about commercial use. So um, it would be really nice if we could have something like that in the in the new EOS future catalog, so that the, for example, members of the community of practice would be able to evaluate the training materials that they like and maybe even comment why they like it and why it's good. We, we have something like that in the ESC pillar, so you can actually rate from one to five uh, each of the resources, but at the moment, really no one's using it. <laughs> um, but I think it's a nice, if it was used uh, or encouraged somehow, uh, I think it's a nice way to um, to indeed um, have a, an idea of the quality of the material or how up to date it is. I can also maybe shed some light from our perspective, and I think this is is really a, 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 a huge challenge for us. Also, I think because we are a registry, so. The first question is maybe how um, how responsible do we have to be for the quality? So, instance for the quality of the of, of the stuff that's in there, and if it's properly curated, if it's fully annotated, and things like that. Uh, and also, you have to realize that it's kind of two step thing because we are scraping from the website of the training providers. So, in a way, there the curation and the proper annotation should take place and then we would be good because then it would go automatically also in 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 tests but we cannot enforce this uh, on everybody but we can work for at least for our own training providers in elixir we are going to work on this uh, it's still a huge number of materials and events that we have in tests but at least it's a bit more or less under our control and we can also ask commitment from the countries to work together with us towards this curation process. And, and, and what I put on the slide was more like, I, I, I call it, I think, uh, maybe curate on a higher level in a way that um, there are so many single, so many individual resources. I mean, first, test is, was, is, is kind of registering and the number of materials is huge that there is no structure, there's no overarching structure or any way that can guide a user other than just type in your question and you will find everything. So the first level that maybe you want to do is more maybe put in a layer with that point people to collections or for specific communities. I mean, this is more or less also the thing, the first step that we're going to work towards in the coming year. And. Uh, but yeah, there are many aspects to this uh, this process for us, at least. And I also have one question. I think, uh, I don't know who said that from EOSC Pillar. So this grading system, was it then intended that like, um, users who came to the catalog would grade it who had used it or something or was it like for your internal quality system that you would have an editorial board or something doing this judging no, it is... and giving grades so that was a question and two yeah okay i would be interested to hear your thoughts uh, no it is intended for the users of the catalog so uh, where you're browsing metadata and then you find a resource that you like, uh, you can grade it. So you can give a, it's a one to five star rate, uh, but we don't use it internally. It's, it's meant for, for the users. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, to, to touch upon the topic of quality of a resource is a very yeah, difficult area to go to. And also for us, in a way, it, I think I think what uh, Irina said to to put a kind of uh, rules of participation on the training provider uh, before being able to 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 connect to the EOS portal. I think we might also maybe to want to do something for our training providers that register things in test. They have to maybe uh, adhere to some minimal standards. We don't have that. Put no. anything in it. 
So yeah, that's something that 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 we should think about. But to to judge individual quality of individual resources, in a way, it's it's a responsibility of the original authors of the materials, and it's not so much on the catalog to do that. So there, there are many, many angles to this discussion. Indeed. Um, I see other interesting ideas in the chats, um, but I think maybe we would have to move to the last challenge because we're a bit running out of time. Yes, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> that will be sustainability. Irina, will you cover it? Yes. Um, so that, that's probably the largest challenge. Sure. And um, as we see, there are already a lot of catalogs out there, and uh, many of them are project based. and. Um, project-based funding isn't sustainable. We have a USC association now, so one uh, hope could be that uh, we present uh, um, a use case and a business case uh, to the USC association and uh, ask them to take over this um, sustainability aspect. Uh, we also address that uh, in uh, the EOSC skills and training report where we suggested to have uh, community governance structures uh, around uh, training catalogs and uh, with those gov governance structures uh, expect that uh, community will be responsible for quality and also for sustainability and uh, I really see this community aspect working, for example, in um, in the case of uh, French uh, publicly funded uh, open science uh, infrastructures. Um, then um, another recommendation was uh, on the software side uh, that use open source software if possible and also open APIs uh, to ensure interoperability, reusability and not to end up in a vendor lock-in. Then, um, of course, project-based funding is, is one solution, but then uh, there might, must, must be some other revenue models and um, it's really hard to think of uh, a specific revenue model uh, when you have a catalog in mind because uh, you don't you don't want to be selling uh, cat catalog records uh, so then then probably uh, there should be some other revenues from training activities subsidizing uh, this catalog work because i think we will agree that it should remain uh, free open um, openly licensed um, yeah, then this economy of scale, cost benefit analysis and economy of scale. Um, how can we uh, work together and make sure that we don't duplicate uh, the efforts and uh, yeah, really uh, reduce costs. Uh, but then, um, like another thing to keep in mind that when we, when we talk about uh, infrastructures like catalogs, infrastructure itself uh, costs very little. So it's not, it's not it's not really the cost of hardware or software. It is a cost of people running those infrastructures. And then it's it's really hard to think of uh, some kind of uh, efficiency or economies of scale in in this way because uh, you really need people to to work uh, work on, on this catalog and um, you know on, on the slides you you see some of the challenges um, described by uh, today's participants um, and I guess we will also have a mentimeter question on that right Ellen We have a Mentimeter question about the sustainability approach to use, and we can can share that. Um, but I was uh, <laughs> just typing something for the chat, uh, so I will just finish it. It was just yes, I first. 
stuff because I think it was interesting ideas also from uh, Elizabeth uh, there and um, sharing my screen on the Minty now. So what sustainability approach do you use for your project and initiatives? That was a question that we had. Um, I think that we as a community have been, as a community of training coordinators, let's say, we have been um, growing in uh, organizing ourselves and for example, organizing these kinds of workshops and bring things together so that we know about each other's catalogs at least, and we know about the issues we face. And we can now also feed back into EELS future and um, so that they can build a catalog and a platform that also maybe makes the sustainability easier in the long run. And co-development was mentioned on uh, test slide on sustainability and we see co-creation with community here. So I guess that's, that's what they also mean when they talk about community governance. So it's not only governance, it's also like collective ownership and co collective development. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm afraid that that's probably the only way to go when we really agree how each one of us could uh, contribute with which resources and uh, for how long and uh, that's I guess as, as sustainable as we can be in this process, of course, with support from EOSC Association, hopefully. Yeah, maybe I can share some thoughts of some experiences that we have with TESS because um, what we also saw is that there are really technical needs and there needs to be programming and, you know, and all the kinds of stuff. This is huge work or can be huge and it takes a significantly amount of funding and man hours to do it but originally our training platform was funded through the training platform but in and there was some funding for building infrastructure but not only it was only mainly for also making the network of the training coordinators making materials guidelines best practices quality and impact framework and everything more the training related tasks so in the first years, we had a lot of funding in the Accelerate and it was built, but now we don't really have that funding anymore. And we also have kind of decided to, I, I, I called it dividing uh, on, on, on the slide, dividing, separating out the technical tasks and more the training related tasks. So with the training group, we have 23 countries with every country as a training coordinator. You have to make sure about adoption, uh, dissemination, outreach, how to use the catalogus, how to use a catalog, how to use bio schemas, et cetera, et cetera. Also, it's also a form of sustainability, but to really get the thing built and going and updated and up and running, this is yeah another aspect. And now the technical team for TESS is working on that. And therefore the co-development comes in, then they are also actively looking at other projects, for instance, uh, that can also use TESS and that are also interested in TESS and build co-development teams for that. But this is not trivial at all. And it's a lot of work and people don't always recognize that, I think. And also if we could make a claim or at least a recommendation to the EOSC Association, I think it's really important that the technical task then lands in the proper place uh, with, with the proper yeah, manpower. Yeah, I think this is a very good point because we tend to think first about the curation of things and, you know, but then you know, th there is this uh, catalog itself that needs to be maintained and needs to be updated and vocabularies to be included, all kinds of things. That is substantial work too. 
um, and how it is recognized in EOSC that it's CypherNet uh, that is responsible for the EOSC marketplace, um, and they are also responsible for um, the setup or, and maintenance of uh, of the catalog. And um, they don't necessarily have specific training related expertise because you, they have to ensure that uh, this catalog works for, for other EOSC resources and for EOSC training resources. So there is this kind of challenge that um, it's a bit centralized in, uh, in the EOSC portal. Yeah, and I agree that we'll, we'll have to continue developing this project application and funding expertise because um, I don't think the cost could be fully covered by um, us or US Association. No. So it's a mix of all the approaches, like really um, deciding together what's what's essential and uh, how we together as a community could support that those essential elements. Um, and, and thanks a lot. There are lots of ideas to take over. Yeah, maybe also um, we have seven minutes. Maybe people have a next <laughs> workshop or meeting, but also would like to ask if there's anything else that you would like to bring up that you'd like to ask uh there's there's now some time left i guess um any of the participants yeah, or... please just just speak up uh, yes we, we are a small group you don't even need to raise a hand i guess maybe i would have a question for the eos creature because they seem to well or they're busy um and, and I think they will address many of the questions or the challenges that we are talking about today. So I wonder if, I don't know, do they want some input from, uh, I, I would imagine that a lot of people that are involved in this catalog are maybe also involved in the future, but do, we, do you want some input from us uh, or how can we uh, be a bit more on track of what is happening so that we can also uh, take this work back to what we are doing in our catalogs. Um, I think that would be my question. Yeah, that, that's the reason why we're setting up those public wiki pages uh, with uh, specifications of the catalog and specification of the learning platform. Um, uh, and uh, when uh, we have a document which is uh, read, ready to be shared, then uh, we would very much like uh, your feedback, uh, whether we included everything needed, um, whether we, what we suggest is uh, doable, and um, how exactly that, that could be done uh, if, if it's not described in the document yet. Uh, so that kind of feedback. Uh, and we'll have uh, one year to, to build this catalog uh, from, um, from the release of um, this document there. So I hope it will be a, a continuous conversation that we'll be having. And then of course, when we'll start prototyping, um, would be get it would be good to get your feedback and of course it will be like a catalog of catalogs so when we'll we'll start integrating your catalogs and if we see that there are some um, issues or, or challenges and uh, that's that's another reason to maybe i don't know adjust the approach or reconsider the approach or, so we we do hope that it will be an, an interactive uh, process um, and uh, that in, in the end we'll, we'll have a tool that would uh, really 
work from for everyone. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question. Um, can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, please, Sam. Hi. Um, so um, my name is Sam, and I'm at Stone Boston University. Um, and my question really has to do with um, ontologies within the context of research data repositories. How can data stewards um, in library environments move from relying on domain agnostic metadata schemas such as Dublin Core and control vocabularies used by catalogers? example, the Library of Congress subject headings, how can they move from that to working with ontologies based on OWL, OWL? This is something I saw um, in the Mentimeter being suggested that um, that should be an ideal solution. Um, shall I have a go at this or does someone else want to? Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> um, it's something that uh, I can speak a little bit on, um, not in relation to terms for fail skills as much, but through fair sharing, um, because we're a repository of, of various resources, databases, data standards, data policies, and we use OWL ontologies. Um, it is tricky because some of our vocabularies aren't out and some of them are, um, but we move stepwise. So for example, a few years ago, all of our vocabularies were user generated. So it was essentially a word cloud. Um, and so of course that's not the same when you're talking about the Library of Congress subject headings because that is already a hierarchy, um, but it's not one that's associated with OWL. But what we ended up doing is a first step is mapping um, with our curation team from the, ta the tags we had to the tags we wanted. And then we uh, implemented all of the various background code that was required for hierarchical searching and relationships. It's, um, it's possible, it does take a little bit of development work, but the benefits you get in terms of cross-registry compatibility were definitely worth it for us. Um, there's a lot of really good tools for working with OWL um how files out there and and so i think uh it's hard to talk in a workshop like this about the practicalities in detail uh, but it is something that a number of registries have worked with in the past and now we've got well over we've got the majority of our terminologies are out i if you want to talk more just drop me an email afterwards i don't want to take up too much time here <laughs> thanks right. sure thank you Yes, thank you, Angus, for mentioning um, Fair is Fair to invite catalogs as well to contribute as a test bed. Any other thoughts? I'll definitely look into OWL more. <laughs> That's what I got in the last 10 minutes. I think I think then we have to, you know, say thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions, for your ideas. And uh, I think we already collecting the slides, creating the slides, you already uh, found a lot of things uh, to continue to work on. And, make the world a better place for training resources. Um, so thank you. And um, be, please become a member of the community of practice if you uh, want to stay informed on these kind of topics on training. Mm, yeah, have a, ne have a good morning. If it's a morning to you. Thanks a lot, Ellen Thanks and everyone. Um... Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.